So, my name is Viola Pogel. I'm a professor in the Department of Health Sciences and Technology at ETH Zurich. And it is my great, great pleasure to welcome today Dr. Carl Merrill as our next plenary speaker and you, the audience. So bacteriophage therapy market is growing rapidly in the US, but also in other parts of the world. And uh, the goal is to combat bacteria that cannot be effectively treated any longer by antibiotics. When antibiotics fail to help the patients, phages can often kill drug-resistant bacteria. Phages highly specifically attack bacteria as they inject bacteria with RNA or DNA, and then they replicate in the bacteria and finally kill it. So as early as 2003, Dr. Carl Merrill published a, a pivotal article entitled The Prospects for Bacteriophage Therapy in Western Medicine. And he published this article in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery in 2003. So it might not be surprising that you then started a company um, called Adaptive Phage Poetics in Maryland. And you are now not only the founder, but also the chief executive officer. And before that, you were a scientist at National Institutes of Health, and you now have the position of an emeritus scientist there as well. So, we are very much looking forward to your talk. And uh, later on, we have reserved sufficient time for a uh, hopefully lively question answer session. So the screen is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to participate. Um, I'm going, this presentation will be a very personal presentation. It will be a journey that I've taken in this direction that started in the 1960s. And so with that, I, the, the, I want to just bring us up to date right now and point out that um, we, we, the infectious diseases, particularly antibiotic resistant diseases are becoming ever more important and killing more and more people, um, not to mention the morbidity too. So the, the, as a, sense of perspective, we have to realize that the bacteria have been on this earth for at least 3.8 billion years. Um, that's versus the 2 million years that human or human-like uh, ancestors have been here. The bacteria undergo half a million generations for each human generation. Antibiotics were first developed by early pre precursors to funguses 2 billion years ago. So they're, they're fairly recent too. And uh, the, the bacteria started developing antibacterial defenses. Many people think we make antibiotics in factories, but in fact, it's the funguses that make the antibiotics. They don't make them for us. They make it to help them survive. And as many of you know, there are certain funguses that will kill you, like some of the mushrooms that we shouldn't eat. Um, and um, the other thing is that um, the bacteria immediately started developing defenses against the antibiotics. Um, so um, we find uh, enzymes that can destroy or inactivate uh, penicillin and penicillin-like drugs. In 1915, in human stool samples that were saved for one reason or another in Great Britain, and this is 25 years before penicillin was introduced. So the point is the, these resistance factors are already out there and they've been there for millions, if not billions of years. Um, and the, the bacteria have had over a, not three, almost 4 billion years to, to develop defenses against the viruses and almost as many years in developing resistance to the antibiotics. As far as the bacteriophages go, in a way, their discovery goes back to 1896 when Henkin probably found uh, heat sensitive material that was filterable. He didn't, he didn't carry the experiments further, but Edward Tort in England actually found filterable entities that could make plaques on plates. Felix Durrell followed up by that 
and inadvertently forgot to mention that Ed Twert had done this earlier, um, but he also found uh, filterable elements. And he went further. He started treating diseases um, with, with, the, with these elements. Um, the, what people don't realize is that um, Twert, um, uh, not Twert, but Durrell, came to the United States and he got everybody excited about phage. And in the United States, there were groups that began to try to use it. And some of them were fairly modern in their approach. This group at Columbia University um, in the 1930s and early 40s, uh, they treated over 500 people with um, staph septicemia. You have to realize in those days, um, th there wasn't any treatment for these kinds of diseases. There were only 17% survival. But if they took phage that they had isolated from the staph septicemia, purified it crudely by just passing it through a filter, um, and then gave it back to the patients. Now, this is done IV because staph, staph septicemia is in the blood. And, um, and they got a 46% survival, which is much higher than the 17%. Now, admittedly, they did not do the kinds of controls we wanted now. Um, and the, the, the difficulty was that the pharmaceutical companies began to, let me see something. Ah, right, yes. The, the pharmaceutical companies jumped in on this very early on and they started selling actually mixtures of phage. They gave them various names like staph low gel, et cetera. Um, the problem was that, um, that, that the, these, as I mentioned, the, the, there were other groups that, that did not commercialize it and they, they were fairly careful. But the, 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 one, the pharmaceutical companies, they, 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 first of all, they didn't do any controls. Um, there's certainly no double blind sorts of controls like are required now. Um, they, they, didn't, they didn't worry about the, the loss of activity on storage. They might produce their, their cocktails in, say, New Jersey, and then they shipped them all around the country. Durrell had already discovered that, um, that he, had, he had gotten into trouble because he had isolated a phage in Indochina. It worked in Egypt, but it didn't work in India. So he knew that that you know there there were particular strains and it was the, the host range was fairly narrow but these pharmaceutical companies didn't understand that and they made a number of errors and the doctors got very upset and they started complaining and so the American Medical Association had a council and they um they 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 examined the whole situation they actually asked for the government to step in uh, but one of the things they did was to stop publishing anything on phage. So phage began to have a, a checkered career. Um, and, and in fact, um, it, it be, it, it, people just didn't want to use it because of these problems. Um, however, I should point out that the, um, the, 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 the Second World War started around this period of time. And the American government realized that uh, we, we needed to treat wounds and infections. And uh, we just couldn't afford to ignore phage. So they, they recruited, the War Department recruited well-respected investigators like Rene Debeau at Harvard uh, to, to try things. And, and Rene Debeau tried, he decided to do a very difficult experiment that is to inject Shigella dysentery into the, into the brains of mice. There's a blood brain barrier, so it's gonna stay there. And then he's gonna inject the phage intraperitoneally, so it'll get into the circulatory system. And the question is, can it get into the brain? And then he, he watched to see what the concentration was. You see on the left that the concentration of the phage just went, went down in the blood. Although um, in the brain, um, it started going up, even though it was not in fact injected into the brain. So that meant the phase could get through the blood brain barrier. It could get into the brain and it could start replicating. And in fact, it, it saved the animals. He, he gave a LD 95. So only three, three, three percent of the animals or 4% uh, survived. 
without any treatment, but with the treatment, he could, if he gave it right away, he could save almost all of them. And um, he, um, the, 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 um, the, 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 the physician, the problem was though, that um, at this same time, this is around the period that the antibiotics were introduced. And so um, people uh, basically began to use the antibiotics rather than the phase because they had broad spectrum. They didn't understand either the phase or the antibiotics that well, and they still don't to a large extent. Um, so as I said, there are a number of reasons that the, the phase failed uh, in, in the early days. And, and it, it was difficult for anybody to even begin to look to using phase because of that early experience, at least in the United States. Um, I, um, I actually, I'm a physician, but I really wanted to do research. I wanted to understand what was going on in the universe um, and how life arose that sort of thing. And I was lucky I got into a research associate position at the National Institutes of Health right after I finished a, a residency. And, and that gave me the freedom to learn more physics and math. And then I got into the Cold Spring Harbor course, which had been set up by Rene DeBeau and uh, um, to, to use phage to try to understand how life arose on the planet, what life was and how it became conscious. And uh, so the, the basic idea of the course was the fundamental understanding of life itself. But I asked two questions, can phase directly affect humans? Why don't you use phase as an antibacterial therapy? I didn't know that early history at that point. And one of the people in the course was annoyed by my question of why we didn't use it as phase therapy. And he said, haven't you read the book Aerosmith? Now, I... If anybody in this audience hasn't read it, I strongly recommend it. Um, it's a one night read if you read fast. If you read slow, you certainly can finish it in two, two, two nights. Um, and it was written by Sinclair Lewis, but in fact, it was actually written by him and Paul de Cruff, who was a microbiologist at the, um, at the Rockefeller Institute. So in fact, he describes the Rockefeller Institute as the research institute. He did not want his name on the book because he didn't want to be involved in a fictional book. He was a serious scientist. And, um, and because of that, uh, Sinclair Lewis won the Pulitzer Prize, but he wouldn't accept it because he knew that in fact, he didn't write that book by himself. He later won the Nobel Prize for literature. And this book was one of the ones that was included in that. But the book is very important to read. You can read it a number of times, but if you, once you begin to learn about phase, you realize how present the book is. He, the book stresses the importance of a double-blind clinical studies. And it also stresses the negative effects, the life-threatening societal forces of ignorance, greed, and corruption. And this is really what destroyed phase research early on in the 30s by the pharmaceutical companies and still is a problem in, in anything we do, whether in, in medicine or in pharmacology. Um, I realized very soon that in fact, it, we're not just working with phage, we're working with, it's a virus and it infects bacteria, but it also is operating inside a human. We're talking about treating human infections. And we also have the fungal antibiotics that are interacting. So we have a, a complex many bottom body system. You can't ignore one without the other. So one of the first things I did when I got back to the lab at NIH after the Cold Spring Harbor course is I wondered whether or not the phage knew that they were just viruses that could infect bacteria. How do I know they won't affect humans? So um, I, um, I, I, I uh, decided that if I put them in with cell culture, it could do one of three things. It could either kill the cells, and that would show that they really do have an effect directly, or it could change the way the cells grow so they begin to grow abnormally, or it could change their metabolism. So I've tried these, and uh, the phase I used was lambda phase, which was a standard laboratory phase at that point. It actually had been isolated from human diarrhea in 1922. And, and it neither killed nor changed the cell growths in the cell cultures I worked with. And I decided to look at the cell metabolism. When I was in medical school, I, I worked in pulmonary physiology. 
as research and published a few papers as a medical student. Um, and, um, and so when I got back to the NIH, Shanker Aja had just come from California uh, working with Alan Campbell, who had worked out the, the, the mechanism of whereby phage can integrate into the genome of E. coli. Um, it's a site-specific integration. And when it comes out, sometimes it makes an error. It could either pick up the gal genes on one side or the biotin genes on the other side. It only makes the error one in 10,000 times, which is better than most students do on their exams. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it, you can get strains of phase carrying these genes of the galactose operon or the biotin genes. And so the, the Shankaranja had brought back a collection of phase carrying different genes from the galactose operon. And I thought that would be perfect to try against the, um, in, in human cells. And in addition, the, in, in America, they started a collection of human cells from children with defects. And so I put it, this is, this is the galactose pathway. So basically you're converting galactose to glucose. Some galactose is used for structure, but most of it's used for converted to glucose for metabolism. And so many children are missing that have, they have a disease, it's called um, uh, galactosemia. So some of them are missing the transferase enzyme. So I, I got one of his phase with the transferase enzyme. I put it in the cells and they added C14 labeled galactose. And the idea was that if they could convert it, then they'd convert galactose to the glucose, they'd make radioactive carbon dioxide. I could take that out with oil syringe and bubble it through phenethylamine, which is a base, and it absorbed the CO2, and then I could, could put it in a scintillation counter. And when I did that, sure enough, uh, I ended up with more CO2 being produced when I put in phase carrying the, the, the missing enzyme. Um, I sent that off uh, to some friends. Uh, my mentor at NIH at that time was a physical chemist, Dan Bradley, and he worked with Melvin Calvin, who won the Nobel Prize for photosynthesis. He suggested that I really should, if I, this, is a, this is a revolutionary experiment. If I really want to check into this, I should have a direct assay for the enzyme, but there weren't any. So uh, that's the paper that I wrote early on. You'll notice one of the authors was John Petrucciani. He had just come from Stanford Medical School. You'll see he plays a, a major role later on. Um, so I ended up, the, there was a husband and wife team and they developed thin layer chromatography. And by using that, I could separate out the different path, parts of the pathway of the galactose metabolism. And I could show that I could have the enzyme activity. It took me a year to do that. And, and there's the results. So you can see that um, I, with all the controls, I didn't get any increase in, in, um, in, in transferase activity, but I did get it when I put in the, the virus carrying the gene. That was published in Nature. And there's John Petrucciani's name. Mark Geyer was a, a student in my lab at that time. Um, and so we published that paper. Everybody got excited at first. Jürgen Horst in Germany reproduced the work with the P. Lac gene in human cells, but a number of people began to, to say they didn't believe this. And, and many of them were very vocal. And in fact, recently, uh, Eric Bodman, who's a reporter, he wrote an article about me and this episode in the, in the online journal Stat. And one of the people who was very vocal and attacking this whole thing basically admitted that he, he did that because he thought my ideas were very strange. And it wasn't that he tried to reproduce the experiments. It was just because of his, his, his basic, his bias, if you want. Uh, Berg also attacked it. But later, he, he actually was able to, he did the same experiment, but using a different gene, an E. coli gene. And he published it, but he didn't, he forgot about the fact that I had done it earlier. And other people like LaProca also did that. Letitia Benincourt is interesting because she's, she did it more recently, but more important with Letitia is that she uh, actually showed that there were mammalian promoters in some of the phase genes, particularly the toxin genes. So she showed that the sugar toxin gene, either the DNA or the phage itself, 
can kill the animals. It doesn't have to make the toxin in, in a bacteria. Um, and since that time, we've discovered that there are a lot of toxin genes carried by phage. Um, and, and so a lot of people say, well, we don't have to worry about phage because they, they, don't, they, they can't cause any problems. But of course, if they have toxin genes in them, they can kill, kill people. In fact, you'll notice the one on the bottom is the diphtheria toxin. So that killed um, one third of the children in New England in, in 1735. Many of you probably don't remember that. It was called the Great Distemper Epidemic. Um, and they didn't know it was diphtheria at the time. I want to point out that one of the reasons I did that early experiment was because I wanted to prove to myself and, and the world that the that viruses are basically, um, well, first of all, that all life uh, uh, is basically a universal constructor machine. Well, it's a computer. And, and uh, it was John von Neumann who, who began to realize that in the 1940s, but he did not understand life, so he, he couldn't put the whole story together. And, and a virus is, in, in life, you have a translating machine to convert whatever the, is in the memory into little wiggly machines, which we call, which are proteins. They're made up of the nucleic acids and a translating machine, which, is the, which we call the ribosome, converts from a four letter uh, code to the 20 letter amino acid code to make the little wiggly devices that then will replicate the whole machine. And that's what all life is. And the viruses are the same thing, except they're lacking the translating machine. So they're, they're obligate parasites, but there's no difference from one virus to another on, in principle. And, um, and, and they, the genetic code has stayed constant from almost the whole time. Now it's true, there are some viruses that have variants in the genetic code, there's some variants in the mitochondrial genome, but they're minor. In general, the, the, the genome has stayed pretty darn constant. And there are other symmetries that have been broken in life. That is, all the amino acids rotate plain polarized light to the left and all the sugars to the right. Um, if you don't, a lot of people say they still don't believe this, but I invite you to take a walk in the woods. And if you do that, you'll see plants that look like this. They have tumors on them. And we now know those tumors are caused by bacteria, agrobacter tumor facients that injects a plasmid into the plant cell and changes the metabolism of a plant cell, which results in those tumors. And in fact, if you look at the, at the plant, um, it, it, Agrobacter tumor facients has a syringe to inject the DNA. It's similar to the syringe in the phage. And in fact, they, they share not only structure, but homology in the, in the genomes of them. Um, I, because I did that early experiment, I wondered if phage could replicate in a mammalian cell. And in doing that, I never actually did the experiment as much as I would have liked to, but in one of the controls diverted our attention because it turned out that um, even if I didn't add any DNA or phase to a mammalian cell culture, I could still get plaque forming units. And, and so I, I ran around the NIH uh, and I, I got fetal calf serum from other labs just in case my lab had contaminated it and they were all full of, uh, of phage. Um, and so I sent a memo to the FDA. This was in, in, uh, in 1972 and told them about this. And in 73, uh, they, they held a press conference and um, they, they had Carl Sabin come down. And he pointed out that, um, that, that, that they, they had a number of experts and they said not to worry that, you know, phase won't hurt anybody. And so in a way, this is a gigantic experiment that shows in general, phase don't hurt people, especially when it's given uh, this way, because the chances of picking up or giving uh, one with a toxin are very low. And I should point out the FDA is well aware of this problem now. So all phase that we develop for therapeutic use have to be genomically sequenced to try to assure that there are no toxin genes in them. Um, and so uh, after that, I, um, I gave a talk at NIH and I mentioned the fact that, uh, that this was in 1975 and there were some problems with one of the vaccines. It was 
during the swine flu epidemic, and they were having an outbreak of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a creeping paralysis. And I pointed out that the that the vaccines uh, had had phase in them. I actually had uh, the FDA didn't want to share any vaccines with me, but as I'm a physician, I wrote a prescription for one of my kids. And, brought it back to the lab, and it had 36,000 platform units against one strain of E. coli. So I gave this lecture. I, it was at NIH. I didn't think there was any reporters in there, but Gina Barry Collado was there, and she wrote for Science at that time. She now writes for the New York Times. And, um, and so she, she wrote down what I said. I said it was desirable to remove, to produce vaccines that don't use contaminated serum and uh, to study the, the phase that are in them. Uh, and, and do epidemiology. And, and I also pointed out that I, I, I think that the vaccines in general are good, but I also mentioned the problem with the diphtheria toxin, that, that, that they can carry a deleterious genes. Um, right after that, um, I, um, I was basically, when, that, when Gina Barry Collada's paper came out, I was actually told I was fired. But uh, thankfully, I'm, I was a commissioned officer in the US Public Health Service, so they couldn't fire me. They could hold the courts martial. They decided not to do that. And they basically told me I could go anywhere in the world for three years and find another position. But I didn't do that because I had kids in school. And although they, they got rid of most of the people in my lab, um, I was able to continue to use the lab. And um, I... Um, I, I was able to actually get the, the lab going again. I want to point out the history of this. After I did that, in 2014, John Petrucciani and another group did a review of, of viral vaccines, and they found that they were still contaminated in 2014. And, and because of that, that review, uh, the, the, the World Health Organization and others suggested that that uh, they should, they, we should reconsider the use of fetal calf serum uh, in regulatory issues. Believe it or not, nothing was really done. And so in this year, in 1922, it became an issue again. So there's an article in January in Science Magazine where it pointed out that there's still a problem, that they're still contaminated. And one of the other problems it's caused is that each lot of fetal calf serum may have different viruses in it. So of course the experiments you do using fetal calf serum may not be that reproducible. And that has caused a lot of problems with people who are trying to do uh, experiments with the various drugs, including those for cancer. So a lot of funds have been lost because of that. And there's questions about the vaccines that are still being produced using the fetal calf serum. Um, I, I actually, one of the things that helped redeem me was that I, I discovered um, the, the use of silver for a highly uh, um, a sensitive of method of detecting proteins and nucleic acids. It was over a thousand fold more sensitive. And, um, and at that time, I started, we also started with a few people left in the lab to do animal experiments to see what happens when you inject phage in an animal. Because people had argued that, that the phage would be taken out very quickly. Um, and so sure enough, um, we, we did this in germ-free animals so that we didn't have to worry about the effect of, um, excuse me, uh, so we wouldn't have to worry about the effect of, um, of, of the bacteria, bacterial growth, as you saw in those early experiments. But you could see it, 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 it went down at different rates in different tissues. It, and the, the spleen actually keeps the virus for quite a long period of time after you inject it. And that's a whole other area that we could discuss someday. Um, these results were similar to those that other people like Inslee had gotten. Uh, and, um, and they showed that most of the viruses is picked up by the liver and destroyed in the liver. So I didn't pay a lot of attention to this. Um, let me go back. Um, but but um, Smith and Hudgens in, in England, um, they were they they began to use phage at the, right after I published that one in Nature, and they showed that the phage actually seemed to work better 
than the antibiotics. And furthermore, whatever was resistant to the phage very often then had antibiotic sensitivity. So you, the phage is helping to select uh, here. Um, the, um, th this, this just, uh, I, let's see, I, I got some volunteer mice and I injected uh, phage into them and, um, and, and did selection. And I was able to get phage this way in a very short order that could stay in the circulation uh, 10,000 fold longer than, than the ones that, than the wild type. This was with Lambda. It was not because of a difference in, immune, in, in their interaction with the, with the immune system. Um, and was able to show this was due to a single mutation in one of the head, the, the, the E-capsid gene, a, a major head protein on, on, the, uh, on the lambda phage. So, um, and, and this was reproduced later by genetic engineering to show that it was just that single mutation that could have that effect. And then I began to really start doing some experiments because I, I began to realize that antibiotic resistance was becoming more and more prevalent and that phage could be used and showed that you could treat animals even after uh, uh, in infection uh, and after they began to die, uh, you, you, this is their, their state of health early on. And then um, you, you can see, even if we let them get, become semi-morbid, uh, we could still save a number of them. Um, and so we, um, the, shortly after that, there was an epidemic at NIH and uh, people started, they, they lost a number of people in the war. So uh, Shankar Aja, Dean Scholl and I proposed a clinical trial to use phase to, to save these patients. And it was rejected because the review board said that, the, that they'd get resistance to the phase. And it was that that stimulated me to write that review paper in Nature and come up with the idea of making phase libraries because there are 10 to the 30th phase on the planet. And, and 10 to 31 approximately. So we, we could have a giant library. We could continue to use that. And I started to, my, one of my postdocs who worked with me actually came to the lab as a student was Dr. Biswas. And um, he, after uh, he left my lab, uh, he got a PhD in the lab. He, uh, he joined the, a Navy group, the Biodefense Research Directorate. And they started inviting me to give lectures to them and to meet for lunch. And, uh, and we worked out various uh, ways that we could augment this, this approach. Uh, I didn't realize they were really thinking about it, paying attention to me till one day they told me that they needed a, a picture with me with a tie on and that I should come and give a lecture to a larger number of people. So there were over 100 people there. And that surprised me. Uh, but it, it was even more surprising the next year when, in fact, they, they had done everything I suggested and uh, they treated the first patient, and that was Tom Patterson. And, um, and, and he came out of, he was in a coma for quite a while. And within two days after being given the phase that they had isolated uh, at the Navy, um, they were able to rescue him and... and um, and so he wrote a book, he and his wife, Stephanie Strathy. Uh, she was the one who realized that she's, she's a, an epidemiologist and she, she was the one who pushed to get phase used. Uh, and so that it was used at, at the University Hospital in San Diego. And, um, and she wrote a book about that uh, called The Perfect Predator. Um, and, and he recovered fully uh, and there he is there. Um, and, and so that the, the lessons for us were that we had used, it was predetermined by, uh, by the treating physician that we should use fixed cocktails of four phase, but the Navy had 98 phase at work against uh, Acenobacter umani, but only four of them uh, were active against his specific infection. So the, that points out if you just pick randomly for an, a, a cocktail, what are the chances you would have picked four that really worked? 
Uh, and the other thing that happened was after a while, the, the bacteria became, they continued to look and the bacteria became uh, re resistant. He started, he came out of the coma right away, but then the, the, you began to get resistant bacteria. They, the Navy went back and they had to find a bacteria from new samples and, and that worked, but it only worked in conjunction with the original four which made them, and they had other evidence that there might be a genetic switch. And so this is a complex mechanism where the virus is losing uh, its outer capsule, becoming an L form and switching back and forth. So you need both of them. Um, and that's what this points out there. Uh, we but, need uh, to come yes. to an end. Yes, I am. So the bottom line is that after this happened, the Navy tried to get the pharmaceutical companies to, uh, to, to help them develop this and get it through the FDA. And, and they weren't really that interested. And so they, they made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. That's how I got into starting a company. Um, and I recruited my son uh, and uh, one of my sons um, who had started other companies. And uh, he's, they've raised a lot of money. The Department of Defense jumped in and the Army has in, in gotten involved, as have many other groups like the Mayo Clinic. This is now the, the company. It's almost a full city block long. It has close to 100 employees and uh, they're beginning to treat lots and lots of patients. Um, and this just shows some pictures inside the, the company. Uh, some of the, they've got some INDs that are now being done, which are absolutely essential. These are the double blind experiments that, uh, that uh, uh, had been suggested in, in the book, uh, Aerosmith. Um, and, um, and, and they, you know, they've continued on. These are some of the people in the company uh, that are, have really are the ones that are driving this company. Um, and these are just some quick pictures here. What I want to point out is that that at the bottom here, you'll see this website, aphage.com. Everything I've told you is on that website. There are videos, there's articles about the book, and there's a lot more material on what's happening right now. So uh, I know that uh, at the end, particularly we rushed through this, but uh, at least that way you can, you can go back and, and get the information that, that we glossed over. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Carl. We, you gave a wonderful talk. And we are now switching to the discussion room. Um, we were sent a link in the chat. And all of us now need to click on that link that will close the site and open a new site on Zoom. And uh, the broad audience has access to that site. And then we continue with our discussion.